Season 3 of Lawyers with Game is here. We're talking to Arash Daroudi, General Counsel of Fender Musical Instruments, about everything from the history of the music industry to artificial intelligence. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lawyers with Game. I'm Darius Gambino, and I'm an attorney at Saul Ewing in Philadelphia. Over 25 years of practice, I've advised clients on issues related to patents, trademarks, and copyrights. I'm also a lifelong gamer, currently playing on the PlayStation 5. You can find me on the PlayStation Network as EaglesFan71. I'm really excited to have as my guest today, Arash Daroudi, General Counsel at Fender Musical Instruments. Besides being an all-around interesting guy, Arash is a huge champion of diversity in the workplace, and we're going to talk about some of those issues today. Arash, welcome to the program. Thank you, Darius. Such a pleasure to be here. So um, Arash, uh, it, besides being a, a generally interesting guy to talk to, uh, is a huge champion of diversity in the workplace, and I'd like to just jump right in with you and talk about that. Uh, we met for the first time at uh, a diversity uh, presentation that you gave at, at my law firm, um, and I thought your sor story was so interesting, and I really connected with it. Can you talk a little bit about um, your path to your current role and, and some of the obstacles you faced uh, being born here, but growing up in Iran, and then uh, you know even some of the obstacles you faced uh, in the legal world in, in getting to where you are today? So I was actually born in Houston, Texas, uh, to two students from Iran. At that time, prior to the revolution in 1979, uh, the, the government would send uh, young students from Iran to the United States and Europe so that they would get educated and then they would go back uh, to Iran. So I'm born in Houston, Texas, and in 1979, a revolution happens, and my parents had to make a decision. Do they stay in the United States, forego their entire family and, and, and their citizenship in Iran and just stay in the U.S., or do they go back? They decided to stay. The unfortunate part was that they were on student visas, so they couldn't actually afford to provide for a six-month-old child, which was me. And I was a U.S. citizen born in the United States with a U.S. passport. I had no issue going back and forth to any country, so they decided to send me to Iran with my grandparents for a period of six months while my parents stayed in the U.S., procured their visa, procured jobs and an apartment, and then they would summon me back to the United States. Well, I got to Iran, and about three to four months later, all-out war broke loose between Iran and Iraq. I actually got stuck in Iran for seven years. So I didn't see my parents until I was seven years old again in JFK Airport uh, in, in 88. And, you know, it's always fascinating. I always get this question that, did your parents ever regret it? If, if you guys could have done it differently, would you have done it differently? And my response is absolutely not. Those experiences of, of living in Iran during the war and seeing that at such a young age truly built me as a person. I think I, I probably matured at least 10 to 15 years throughout the period I was there. So we ultimately, uh, when the borders opened, we went to 19 different countries in order to get my passport reinstated and to get a visa for my grandparents so I could come to the U.S. and finally made our way back and settled in, uh, in Maryland. Hence, I, I grew up in Maryland. And so then uh, let's talk a little bit about your first couple of jobs in the legal world and uh, some of the prejudices you faced in, in those jobs and, and how that really um, uh, dictates and informs how you practice today and the type of team that you've built at Fender. Yeah, absolutely. So I read a book. I read a book when I was in middle school called Barbarians at the Gate. So for those unfamiliar with it, the book chronicles the largest leverage buyout uh, in history, which was of RGR Nabisco. This is like in the 80s during the time of Michael Milken and junk bonds and such. I was fascinated by this book. I just found it so intriguing that you had all these lawyers that were working on these high, exciting deals and high level negotiations and such. And I said, this is what I want to do. Well, lo and behold, I came out of law school and a friend of mine who worked with one of these major, major uh, organizations involved in that, in that space said, there's a recruiting event. Get yourself to this recruiting event in DC. 
there's going to be the recruiters from that particular firm and you may meet somebody and you may get in. I said, wow, what's the chances of that? So I ended up going to the recruiting event. It was at the Mayflower Hotel in D.C. And it was more of a uh, meet and greet open bar session. And I was there and I was at the bar when I noticed one of the managing partners walking towards the bar to refresh his drink. And I also noticed that perhaps maybe he was drinking a little bit more than he should have. So he was a bit jolly. I said, this is the opportunity. I'm going to go in. I'm going to introduce myself, talk to him. So I went in and, and I introduced myself. And about two to three minutes later, he turns to me and he says, so what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, this is an amazing firm. It's been a dream to work in this space. I'd, I'd love to join. And you have an international presence. International is my forte. He said, have you looked around the room? And I said, yes. He said, you don't really fit the pedigree to be here, do you? I said, what pedigree is that? He said, just look around the room. He left. Darius, I put down my drink, got my valet ticket. I was completely deflated, got in my car and left. Fast forward, I was to be GC of a company and went through, there was a vacancy. The general counsel at the time left the organization and I, I went in to, to interview because everybody around me said, you, you should do this. This is you. you. You should be the general counsel. And so I interviewed with the C-suite. I interviewed with uh, the board. And I also interviewed with the chairman of the board, which was the basically the owner of the organization at the time. And I remember I walked into a conference room, very similar to where I'm sitting right now. I went up. I went to shake his hand. And he refused to shake my hand. And so at the time, I thought that this was some sort of Jedi mind trick, referring to the Jedi <laughs> Uh, figurines you have behind you. I thought this was some sort of type A Jedi mind trick, private equity world. And I said, it's not going to phase me. So I sat down, the interview starts. Five minutes into the interview, he says, look, I'm going to short circuit this. You don't fit the look or the type to be a general counsel. It's just not going to happen. I stood up. Obviously, I didn't shake his hand because he wouldn't shake my hand. I said, thank you for the opportunity. I went up into my office. I closed the door. I said that the next time that I walk down there, I'm going to become the general counsel of this company. Exactly one year later, I walked down and I became the general counsel of this, that company. And then I decided to make a difference. Because fundamentally, Darius, what I see as these positions being is these are positions for vehicles for change. I was the first one in this company's history to hire the first female attorney. The first female attorney in 77 years, I hired the first female attorney, first African-American attorney, Asian-American attorney, LGBTQ, Native American, veteran. And then I didn't stop there. I went to the law firms and we changed the demographics there. Fundamentally, I think that diversity is very, very important. I believe it's our, it's our competitive advantage in the world. Absolutely. And it's, it's such a, to hear you tell that story and, you know, it, it's almost like something out of a movie. Um, it's that it's that unbelievable. But um, the fact that you're telling those stories um, helps people understand and I think helps us grow uh, as, a, as a society. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, we'll move on to something a little bit lighter, uh, which is uh, something that's been in the news a lot lately, which is artificial intelligence um, in, the, in the music industry in, in which you operate, um, we've, we've seen a lot of different um, uh, aspects of artificial intelligence. I just saw uh, something within the last couple of weeks where they were able to um, simulate Frank Sinatra's voice singing Gangster's Paradise by Coolio, yeah. which, which I thought was um, pretty amazing. We've seen it with um, talked about with the Beatles and reproducing um, the voices of uh, the Beatles that have passed. Um, and, and so what is, uh, what is your take on AI? A lot of people have a negative take on it. That's, that's not my take. I think ultimately, um, it's going to help us just like any other tool has helped us along the way. Um, what, what's your take on artificial intelligence and particularly its impact on the music industry? Yeah. You know, I think in humanity's evolution, uh, fundamentally, whenever there's leaps in technology, the first reaction that human beings have is fear. You know, when you take a look back at the creation of high-speed trains, which at that time was 50 miles per hour, there was literally a movement that, that was, was seeking to stop the use of these high-speed trains because they felt that they would 
cause health issues and such. And in fact, pregnant women were not permitted to to use 50 mile per hour trains because they thought that really undesirable consequences would happen to their kids. That's our status sort of uh, a neutral mode for humanity. We always go back to the fear point. However, whenever you have leaps in technology, it completely changes our, our lives. I think artificial intelligence is exactly that. And I'll give you an example as to why that is. Rock and roll. So very fitting, I work for, for Fender, very much uh, a, a, a sort of a foundational member of, of rock and roll and many other genres of music. When you take a look at rock and roll, rock and roll was actually the love child between the Mississippi Delta Blues which was the music of the newly freed black slaves in the South and the music of Ulster. Many Americans don't even know what Ulster is, but it's their ancestors. Ulster represents Scotland and Ireland. And those folks uh, immigrated to the United States, came down the Appalachian Mountains and settled throughout as well as in the South. And they brought with them two really important elements for music. They brought limericks, basically Ulster poetry, but they also brought with them the fiddle, what we know as the, the fiddling music of, of Europe. When you combine the music of Ulster and the music of the Mississippi Delta Blues, that gave birth to rock and roll. Now, think about how many millions and billions of different things had to occur in human history in order to facilitate the combination of these two very diverse sets of uh, musical genres, the music of the black slaves and the music of Ulster, how in the world geographically separated did these two finally come together? Imagine we use a technology that will allow us to simulate potential creation of new genres of music, but instead of it taking thousands of years for the evolution to occur, it occurs at a click of a button. That's the most exciting part about artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, to it, it's almost like with the advent of sampling, you know, that 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 also had its issues, right? Um, especially in copyright law, which I'm very familiar with. Um, there were a lot of people that were against it. A lot of people that thought it was uh, anti music industry to sample. Um, but ultimately, we got a lot of great music out of it. And I think AI, um, I think what you're saying is that we can do the same thing with AI, we can use it um, to, to push the music industry forward in different directions and combine different styles. I don't, I don't know that the combination of, of Frank and Coolio was necessarily the best use of AI, but, uh, but things, things like that. No, but you bring up a very good point, which is one is let's embrace the fact that this is going to be the next leap in, in human, uh, technology evolution. That's accepted. You cannot stop it. Whenever you introduce something so powerful, there is no way that you can, you can, Stop it. But you should control it. So you should create boundaries. Intellectual property is a big one. So obviously, the notions of copyright law come into, come into effect. Also, you have these AI generative tools that you go into the tool and you literally say, create me a song that uses a sitar, but sounds like it was uh, recorded in Abbey Road studio and then add some African beats to it. Who is the actual creator of that, of that piece of work? Is it the person using the computer and the regener generative AI, or is it the AI system? Will in the future actually AI uh, systems have their own identity, have their own rights? These are things that we never think about, but people always say, oh, no, that's crazy. Well, if you go back 500 years or so and you say that in the future animals are going to have rights, where there's going to be notions of animal rights, they'll say, what are you talking about? How can an animal have rights? Today, most countries of the world recognize animal rights. Um, yeah. So it is very, very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a closely related topic uh, that, that I wanted to talk about, also actually just to finish that point about who owns this, right? There's been a lot of litigation, a lot of uh, talk in the news recently about chat GPT and art programs like Dolly, uh, in mid journey. <clears throat> and I think, I think we have to make sure that the images and the music, um, and the words that were used to create these AI tools. A lot of people don't realize that these were all created, um, based on the works of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other people. We need to make sure those people get, get compensated in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Because some portion of what they created is being used. 
And the question of whether or not me sitting at that tool, using it to create something new is my own creation is, is one question. But the other question is, we have to make sure that people are compensated in the, in the process of creating this new technology, right? 100%. That's also where AI comes in, because I think AI will be an unbelievably powerful force in IP enforcement. So I think that it's going to completely elevate uh, the role of IP enforcement to a level that we've never seen before. And then if you can sort of bake in elements of blockchain into it, creators can actually get compensated in real time where the system is seeking out the internet and is able to identify any sort of uh, copyrights and, and seeks uh, reimbursement for it as well as accreditation, like you said. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up blockchain. That was the other thing I wanted to talk about. I mean, we're seeing a lot more blockchain being used. I'm seeing it being used as a legal tool uh, mm -hmm. to record um, the evidence of, of something existing, um, of a trade secret, of a copyright transfer. Mm -hmm. um, how are you seeing blockchain being used in, in positive ways uh, in, in, your, uh, in the music industry and in the legal world? First off, why is blockchain necessary? In my opinion, blockchain and just Web 3.0 in general, the largest purchase usually that an average consumer in the United States makes is a home, is when they buy their home. When you buy your home, in most states and jurisdictions, you get a deed. That deed is typically filed in the local county records. A lot of counties still to this day utilize paper-based forms of those, of those uh, deeds. Some of them scan it and hold it on the local drive there, which fundamentally means that your most expensive purchase in your entire life is all dependent on either a piece of physical paper sitting in some county office or uh, sitting on a county computer. That fundamentally feels to me very 18th century. So when, when blockchain actually gets introduced where we can have smart contracts, the ability to have that contract or deed live in the internet, but it's actually verified by thousands and thousands of sources, then in essence, it almost becomes indestructible. I think that's really, really exciting from even the most fundamental things like deed recording. Now let's get into the future of uh, of uh, rights and being able to, to get compensated for, for your music. I think that the future of publishing, music publishing, because in essence, what is the purpose of music publishers? Music publishers aid the creators in getting paid for their work. They make sure that if, if their song ends up in a, in, a, in a commercial or their song ends up in a, in a movie and such, they get paid for it. Well, what if we're able to automate the process through using blockchain, where in essence, all of these uh, rights are, are, are living in, in the digital space and you have blockchain that knows exactly who needs to get compensated. And then there's a record of it as far as why the person got compensated, how much they got compensated, and that lives on forever. I think that is super, super exciting. Uh, one of the saddest thing about creators is the fact that they are incredible. But a lot of times what happens is they just don't get compensated the way that they should for their, for their art. And, and I think that's a great way to use blockchain is, is in the mu music publishing context. There's a lot of other different uh, contexts, but it, you know, rather than going to these antiquated systems, which I think the music industry has its fair share of, um, that's, that's definitely a, a great use of it. Um, yeah. Staying on uh, the digital media topic, um, I wanted to, to ask you about NFTs. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of artists are, are using them as as um, uh, add ons to tickets for concerts. And we're seeing, um, you know, lots of other uh, digital trading card uses and things like that. Um, we're seeing them being awarded um, in inside of video games, which is a particular interest to me. Um, what what is Fender doing in that space um, in terms of NFTs? That's a good question. Approximately two and a half, three years ago, this notion of NFTs sort of came on my radar. As a general counsel, I believe that we always need to be at the forefront of emerging technology. Where are we now and where are we going? And I started to see NFTs come out. At first, you know, you sort of think of it as, as some sort of internet, uh, not a scheme, but you sort of think of it as an internet, internet meme of some sort that it's popular for a second and goes away until... I noticed that NFTs were selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
So then the, the the concern came up is, well, we have a lot of trademarks, not only trademarks for names of our products, like the Stratocaster and the Telecaster, but we also have a lot of trademarks for the design of certain aspects of our guitars, like the headstock and such. Immediately, I, I reached out to the IP team and said, look, this is fundamentally, I think, where the world is going. We need to protect ourselves from an IP perspective. Now, the question ultimately where you're an expert in this realm is, at what point is it art? At what point is it fair use versus at what point is it actually infringement and they're using your intellectual property rights to, to benefit themselves and such? It's difficult, even to this day, that, that argument is, is difficult. But from my perspective, we, we filed several, several trademarks to protect our, our names and our designs in that space. So, so if there are uh, Fender guitars in the, in the metaverse, uh, inside of worlds like Roblox and things like that, then those are things that you've already um, protected uh, through trademarks and through other IP. Exactly right. That's exactly that, right. That's great. Um, that, and that, and that brings me to my question. I, you know, we have to talk a little bit about IP since I know you and I both have, have an interest there. Um, you've been with Fender approximately what, eight, eight years or so now? Eight and a half years. Um, it, to the extent you can talk about it, to the extent it's not privileged, um, what are like one or two of the biggest, uh, you know, intellectual property hurdles that you've, you've faced along the way? Yeah. You know, it goes back to Fender's history for all the IP, um, IP experts out there. Leo Fender, uh, the, the founder of Fender Guitars, essentially was a World War II radio repairman. He was an engineer by heart. He actually didn't even know how to play the guitar. He couldn't play a chord if it saved his life. But he had an engineering mind, and he actually created an incredible instrument. Uh, being an engineer, his mind really was not so much on the business side of things or on the legal side of things. So at that time when he, he created the Stratocaster and the Telecaster, he actually didn't seek any trademark protection for the design of the body of the guitar, which is the main, main uh, element of the, of the instrument. Only approximately 40 some years later did my predecessors actually seek to file um, a trademark protection for the body design. But by then it was too late. It was, for the most part, really used quite uh, commonly throughout the world and such. And there was a consortium against the filing of the trademark. And fundamentally, we, we lost that case. However, we were able to get protection on the headstock design. This is the end of the guitar all the way at the, at, at the um, top. For me, that is one of the biggest areas of IP uh, enforcement, IP prosecution, Anything related to IP is really the remaining element of this guitar that I have protection on, which is that headstock. So this is primarily what I've been, uh, I've been left with as far as protection, and I protect that to a T. So we see it all the time. Frankly, I was, I was in a store the other day, and I saw, um, I, I saw this T-shirt with a cartoon character on it, and it had a Stratocaster with our headstock design on it. Unless that's licensed, that's something that we would actually seek to enforce. So that is, that is truly a very, very significant um, part of our IP enforcement across the world. Um, the other aspect of it is in 2021, in the beginning of 2022, we purchased, this was Fender's largest acquisition in its history, we purchased a company called Personis. Personis is a digital audio workstation. Essentially, for those who are unfamiliar with digital audio workstations, if you ever see a music producer in front of a computer with a whole bunch of colorful gibberish in front of them creating music, that's a digital audio workstation, what we call a DAW. What's fascinating about DAWs and what I have to protect Fender into the future is the fact that at what point can a competitor simply say that you have the sound of the 1956 Stratocaster as a digital form? and you no longer are reliant on the physical product. I have to be able to protect that. So that's the other exciting part of IP. Yeah, no, I know quite a bit about that. Um, my son actually just finished up uh, a music program at Drexel where he learned how to use Pro Tools, Ableton, uh, several different DAWs, and, and I know exactly what you're talking about where you, know, you have these different plugins, basically you know, different um, buttons you can press with inside the producing software yeah. to create different sounds. Uh, and then you have things like 
uh, you know, digitally created uh, amplifiers that that create different sounds. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, that all goes back to the analog sound that was created by those guitars, by the way that they're shaped, by the way that the pickups are placed, mm -hmm. by the the engineering of the pickups. Um, so that's that's to me, that's a really interesting thing um, yep. to, to, to look at as well. Um, I, I want to ask you a little since we're talking about guitar playing a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Fender Play app um, since we. We try to talk a little bit about video games on here, and, and we, we might do that uh, a little bit later. But, um, you know, the, the Fender Play app to me is, is an interesting cross between an educational tool and a game because um, you're, you're basically taking music um, and you're teaching someone how to play it in a very simple, stepwise fashion, and you're doing it with a video and you're doing it with the real music behind it. So... Um, can you talk a little bit about how that project came to be and, um, you know, how, how difficult it was, and I'm sure it was difficult to get the licensing, the music publishing rights to do all of that, um, to make that project a reality. When our current CEO, uh, Andy Mooney came in to Fender, um, he basically asked that there be a complete study done of the guitar market to understand who our consumers are, who is buying the guitars who's holding on to them, who's buying additional guitars and such. And there was a lot of really fascinating data that came from it, including the fact that 90%, 90% of all first-time guitar buyers quit the guitar the first year. That is a staggering statistic, which means that either they bought it for themselves or somebody bought it as a gift for them, they tried it, and they quit the first year. However, the 10% that actually continue with the guitar, end up becoming, becoming lifelong purchasers, and they purchase upwards of 13 guitars throughout their lifetime. So obviously, from a business standpoint, our goal was to reduce the abandonment rate and thus uh, increase the, uh, the number of players going forward. Fender Play application essentially is one of the best ways of being able to engage with the next generation of players in a medium that they are accustomed to, the digital medium. So we set up a completely uh, full-fledged studio in Hollywood, which has about 90 employees just dedicated to creation of the curriculum, uh, recording of the videos, editing of the videos, distribution, digital application, uh, sort of uh, elements of it and such. And it's proved to be a fantastic product for us. It was fantastic, and then the pandemic hit, and then it became miraculous. So during the pandemic, within the first month, we got 1 million subscribers to the Fender Play application. It was mind boggling. It was, it was actually kind of scary. It's like sending out an invitation to a party and a million people show up at your door. But it was exciting to know that there's this many people interested in, in learning the application. On the music publishing side, it, is, it was very, very challenging. Very challenging to negotiate those deals to be able to get the rights to be able to teach these songs because the way that it works on our on our platform is we don't actually play the recording of the song, so we don't need any rights from the actual record labels. But because we're teaching the song, we need the rights from the publishing companies. The publishing companies, for the most part, are really still stuck in the same um, sort of way of doing business that's been there since. I don't know, the 1940s and 50s and 60s and such, nothing truly has really changed. There's not been much technological innovation. There's a bit of technological innovation in the way that royalties are calculated and reported and such. But in the end, the negotiations and everything is still human to human. Um, but we, we, we got it through. And we got publishing from the, from the largest publishers in the world. Yeah, I can tell you that I was one of those people that downloaded it early on in the pandemic as I was getting back into uh, and, and playing my guitar um, it, it's it's it really unlike anything else I've ever used as a as a tool to aid playing where you don't have a teacher, uh, you know, that you go to and that you see every week. Um, and, and what's I found amazing about it is it's just all these current songs. You can dive into any genre, rock and roll, whatever, and, and you can really find something that interests you. Whereas I found a lot of times I think why a lot of people may quit the guitar over the years is you just don't have the right teacher. A teacher yeah. is into one style of music and you want to play a different style. Uh, and I think with the app, you can really kind of choose your style, which is what, what's interesting to me. And the opportunity that exists for us from a, from a charitable perspective is the fact that 
the funding of music and arts in, in many schools around the country has been on the downward trajectory for decades and decades. Uh, music teachers are really overburdened. In essence, how can one music teacher be able to teach 30, 40 kids at the time? It's just not going to happen. So what we actually realized is that through our nonprofit foundation, Fender Play Foundation, we could equip teachers to be able to utilize Fender Play and provide accounts to all these kids. And the teacher can actually uh, track the progress of the student. And also when the child goes home, the learning doesn't stop. The learning actually continues because they can, they can go through the application. It's got an online instruction there and such. So it's, it's also become a very powerful tool for shaping the next generation of players. So I'll ask you a little bit about celebrities. Um, you have a lot of, uh, of big uh, proponents of your guitars. One of my favorites being Bruce Springsteen. Um, he, he plays a, a Telecaster and a Stratocaster, I think. Uh, and I know uh, you've, you've got quite a few uh, rock and roll heroes uh, in that field. Uh, have you, who have you been able to, in, in your position, who have you been able to um, meet in terms of, of some of the, you know, the heroes of rock and roll that are, that are playing Fender instruments? I've met many. The, the ones that come to mind is Billy Joel, uh, Brian Adams, um, Bruce Springsteen. And what's fascinating about it is your presupposition prior to meeting these folks is that these are demigods. They're going to be seven feet tall and these... They're all very, very short, which is really interesting, but they're also very, very good human beings. 99% um, of every artist that I've ever met, they're very, very grounded, very humble, um, very appreciative of, of sort of your, your liking of their music and such. And so it's been fantastic. But yeah, the, those three are fantastic about you know, Billie Eilish on the newer generation of side of things, David Gilmore. Um, yeah, the list kind of goes on and on. What's amazing about it is what I love about the product is the fact that you can put it in the hands of David Gilmore. You're going to get a completely different music out of him. You put it in the hands of Billy Joel. It's completely different. You put it in the hands of Billy Joel Armstrong from Green Day. is completely different. It's like how versatile is this incredible instrument that in the hands of anybody has a completely different sound coming out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, I'll, I'll end with asking you about the future of Fender. I'm sure there's a lot of things going on. Um, what, what's uh, on the outlook for the next year or so in terms of um, products and, and different things that, that you're working on? Absolutely. So one of the things we're most excited about, at least for this year, leaning on to next year, is the opening of our flagship store. So Fender historically has never actually had a store. So as you know, many, many brands like Nike and Disney have their own store. Fender has never had it. We opened our flagship store in Tokyo, Japan. And it's incredible. I had the honor and the pleasure of being there for the opening ceremony. This is five levels in the middle of Shibuya, which is an incredible shopping district in, uh, in Tokyo. What an, incredible, um, what an incredible site. Now, what's really fascinating is whenever you sell these products outside of the boundaries of the United States, you're not just selling guitars. You're actually selling American culture. You're exporting American culture and you realize how powerful American culture is beyond the borders of, of the United States, which to kind of bring it full circle to, to how you started this discussion about diversity. Without diversity, you would not have the genres of music and the genres of, of art and the genres of movies and such that has come out of this incredible country. You wouldn't have those. It's the diversity that fuels that. It's the it's the immigrants, it's the Italians that came, it's, it's the European Jews that came. It's all these different sort of mixtures of individuals together that creates this incredible art. So we're most excited about the, the Tokyo store and also Personis, the digital realm. Uh, where is it going? Who knows? But we're going to be at the forefront of it, making sure that we're still helping people create music. Absolutely. Well, um, I really appreciate your time today, Arash. This has been fantastic. Um, Lots of interesting stuff going on at Fender. Um, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Pleasure to be here, Darius. Thank you. Please keep in mind that this series is intended to be a general discussion of legal concepts. It is not intended to be actual legal advice. If you need actual legal advice, please reach out and we'll be happy to help you. Well, that's all the time that we have for today on Lawyers with Game. If you have any questions about any of the topics we discussed, drop them into the comments. 
I want to give a special thanks to Arash Jarudi, General Counsel at Fender Musical Instruments, for coming on today and for a really exciting discussion. We'll see you next time on Lawyers with Game. 